Well, we're glad to start our lesson again, and uh, we'll have a chance to look into the life of Moses and how Jesus is even greater than Moses as mediator today. So you should have a mediator page. Welcome. Glad you're here. We'll begin with a word of prayer. Dear God in heaven, we thank you that we can love you with all of our heart and our mind and our strength. We thank you that you love us and you have made a way for us to be in your presence forever and ever. Again and again, you give good gifts to your children and we thank you for that. We ask you to give the good gift of your spirit so that we can understand scripture today and to glorify you and live for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's uh, get right into the lesson on mediator today. And our first passage of scripture is Exodus 19, 1 through 9. We set the stage in that this is uh, the first major event. Good morning. The first major event after Moses and the Israelites come out of Egypt, cross the Red Sea, and rejoice over all those uh, uh, victories that they have experienced that way. So in Exodus 19, the first, the major, major event after that Exodus event is when they reach Mount Sinai. And there on Mount Sinai, God reveals himself before that had been in the fire and the cloud. And on Exodus 19, God expands his revelation of who he is. And so let's do some reading there, starting with verse 1. Yeah. Shall we have Rochelle start? Sure. Okay. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession, although the whole earth is mine. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and you will and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. OK, let's see if we can find the actions of Moses. Question number one, what did Moses do for the people as a as a mediator? What are it? I'm sorry, I talked he, over you. He went up to God? Yes. Yeah. There's an action. Uh, a member of this guy is 80 years old, and he's going up the mountain to God. And then, does he stay on the mountain? No. He's taking the words of God to the people. Okay. So he listens. He remembers. Maybe he writes it down. We don't know for sure. And then what's he do? Takes, takes it physically down the mountain again to the people. And then what happens? What are his actions then? It's like a game of telephone. <laughs> he takes the word of the people of Israel back to back God. Back to God, <laughs> yes. And Moses at the end of verse 9 tells the Lord what the people had said. Now in this chapter, if you look down further, you're going to see Moses going up, Moses coming down, Moses going up, down, up, down, <laughs> up, down, up, down. It's so much that 
scholars are just not really scholars, but those that have a bias against scripture say, there's no way Moses could do all that up and down and up and down and up. The, 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 the Bible's wrong. It, it's, it must be an error. It's just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's up and then up and down. Well, don't <laughs> rush because you're just going to go faster, right? You can just have to go more often. <laughs> <laughs> it took him longer because he was like 80. Was it 80? He was 80. 80. Okay. But he was in full strength at 80. Mm -hmm. yeah, and he seems to gain strength by being in the presence of the Lord, too, on the mountain, which is a different aspect than really where i was planning to go today but it's it is true he seems to get some extended life uh and energy from being in god's presence in this way it's a good cardiac workout on a regular basis well he sure did on my <laughs> side uh and then later on he spends time in the tabernacle with god and like that and it's so much that his face is glowing and the glory seems to rub off on him well, uh, you got the basic idea here, and we can think about mediation in our own day also. You kind of go between two different parties, and sometimes it's a lot of going and going and going. It's a lot of listening. It's a lot of communication. It's a lot of back and forth, making sure that people are really getting the message on either side and trying to bring two different parties together again. Now, what's what had separated the people from God? This isn't right in our text here in Exodus 19. But one thing is in, in the text. Yeah. maybe it's just the sin of complaining they've got they complain before they cross the red sea they complain when they get to the waters of mara and elam that are um bitter they complain about the meat they complain every time they look at the egyptians coming after them in the beginning yeah that is definitely part of it okay. yes that is but there's a, an even greater kind of separation going on than an individual sin in that the people are, while they're made in the image of God, we still have this effect of original sin upon us where our thoughts have a propensity to be, to, to, to be not what God wants us to be. So we are not perfect while we're made in his image. That's not we're not we're not perfect that's not part of the image of god is is being perfect that not part of the image of god for us i should say so there's a separation because god is holy and we are not we are not and we tend because we have christ and his you know he came down and was among us and in close relationship and personal relationship but people in the ancient times they did not have that understanding about the way they dealt with god or gods false gods it was not very personal at all and so for moses to step in between them was really uh necessary in their minds and there had always been priests in egypt interceding for their gods and different uh, people groups and like that very rare now abraham i was gonna i was thinking uh, abraham had melchizedek right as the high priest that he gave his tithe to mm -hmm. okay yeah and so, he did entertain angels and uh, talk to god very friendly but the you know these these are and jacob and isaac to some extent had this relationship but as an these are the rare exceptions rare exceptions sarah also seemed to have faith that way um, but again these are kind of rare exceptions and that's part of it 
And so when God appears, let's see how he appears there on the mountain. We'll go down just a little bit um, in verse 18 of that chapter that we were reading. Chapter 19, verse 18 and 19. Who are we up to? Is it my turn? Yeah. Mount, Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. All right. And one more uh, kind of paragraph will help us. Well, maybe, maybe we just read to the end of the chapter. That will be all right. The Lord descended to the top of the Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up. And the Lord said to him, go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord and they in the perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us to put Limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, Go down and bring Aaron up with you, but the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord, or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Yeah, so we have this coming and going, up and down and up and down. And the, the, he, the Lord is very concerned that the people do not try to approach him because he is so holy and they will die. And this is uh, the severity of God's holiness. Uh, it's only by the grace of our Lord Jesus that we do enter into his presence. And it's a real great gift. Okay. Uh, Exodus 33. Let's read a little bit more about how Moses himself has his interaction with the Lord. Moses interacted with the Lord. This is much later, well, somewhat later, I guess we should say, but still there on Mount Sinai. Exodus 33, verse 12. Yes. <laughs> Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. You are pleased with me. Teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. And the Lord replied, look, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand. Until I have passed. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face but must not be seen. Okay, how uh, how kind of severe this is that Moses, as even as the mediator and the one that God had invited into his presence, cannot really directly see his face and glory. You can only see kind of like the afterburner of the F-16 jet going on, or the the afterglow and and God hides him in the rock there and he's kind of covering him so that he doesn't get blasted by the glory 
that's really what it's like to approach God. And this is where we go to our question number two. How is Jesus our mediator? Uh, because we're going to pick up, uh, you know, where Moses he, he can't see the face of God. Jesus comes as the son of God. And the people behold him. We have seen his glory as of the one and only. And Matthew and the different disciples are able to see Jesus, able to see the Son of God. And he is our mediator. And so there's an advancement. He's personal. He lives among them for 30-some years, maybe 33. We don't know exactly and is God among them uh, in a way that Moses could not experience in his day? So let's uh, pop over while we still have some good time here to see how these covenants are different. Because certainly the covenant on Moses, <laughs> covenant on Mount Sinai with Moses and the people is different than the covenant which Jesus brings and says, uh, this is my covenant, new covenant in my blood. So if you have Hebrews 9, the writer to the Hebrews also wanted to talk about these things to the people, the Hebrew people who understood covenant, especially the covenant on Sinai, and used... Uh, this covenant language and talking about all these things because they were touch points. They were connect points with the Hebrew people, the Israelites. So let's see what we have to uh, find out here in chapter 9, starting in verse 6. Yeah, that's, that's great. Sure. So I mean, who am I following? Dan. It can be your turn. Yeah, we'll just have you start out. Verse 6, 9, 6. Hebrews 9, verse 6. Okay. I'm in Hebrews and not in 9. <laughs> when everything had been arranged like this, the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the person yeah, you got that right, that there's this separation among the Israelite people. They can't go into the most holy place, the presence of God. All right. Thank you, Karen, for waiting. <laughs> this is when the illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshippers. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all, by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. Blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonial unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then for the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleans our consciences, consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are 
Paul may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Let me just break in here, and we, we're going to just divide this up and answer our question. How is Jesus our mediator, according to what we've read so far? He's um, the new covenant. He did away with sacrifices. Yeah. He became the second. Yes. Okay. That's where I'm, I was listening for that to come out. Right. Okay. It's his own blood. And what other language was you in here in verse 15? It was a ransom. Thank you, Diane. That's right. That's that's what I'm looking. He is the ransom. The blood of the animals in the past were just signs of what was to take place in Christ. And he uh, he serves, as verse 15 says, as a mediator, one who brings the new covenant. And the purpose, why all this? Eternal life. Yeah, eternal inheritance, eternal life. Okay, let's continue then with the rest of the chapter and See if we find some more ways in which Jesus is our mediator. Verse 16, right? Verse 16, please, yeah. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. Because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, he took the blood of the calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He says, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in the ceremony. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Right, let's just pause there. What did Moses do as the mediator? He sprinkles the blood over everything and kept it cleansed and ready to be used for ceremonies. Yes, okay, even anointing the high priest in this way, but also over the articles of the tabernacle. Okay, verse 23. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Oh. Just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Okay, thank you. That last verse gives us two more aspects, or two different aspects, of his mediator-type role. The first appearing was to do what? It took away sins. Okay, to bear the sin and take it away. Yep, according to verse 28, take it away. And the second appearing, or the second coming, is to do what? Bring salvation. Bring salvation, yeah, eternal life. And so, Again, it's not that we have the power to go to heaven, but 
Christ brings salvation to us. He brings eternal life to us. And again, he is the mediator even of our resurrection life, our eternal life. And everything fits together really well in that sense. Okay, uh, there's another passage we have of Scripture, just two verses. Let's pick this up and see what First John, you're going to go to the toward the back a little bit. Just a few um, pages, probably, till you get to First John chapter 2. And see that there's an, another role of ongoing mediation that Jesus does for us. Uh, where are we? You remember? I don't remember. I don't remember. Well, Rochelle, you want to take it away? <laughs> <laughs> My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the anointing sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So, yes, uh, this is a, a kind of a present tense type of passage in First John. So what kind of action does Jesus take right now? He's an advocate. Right, right. <coughs> when we go to him and ask for forgiveness in prayer, do we receive it? Absolutely, because he lives and he is advocating and he has provided an atoning sacrifice for a sin that applies to us right now and in this moment. And uh, that makes uh, verse 9 in chapter 1 true all the time for you. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. There's the promise. 1 John 1, 9. And uh, chapter 2 kind of gives us the why. How come? All right. Uh, Another way of showing that he's all-knowing. because He said, I don't want you to sin, but if you do, which he knows we will, you then will. he gives us this way. <laughs> It's a very practical <laughs> passage. It's almost kind of tongue-in-cheek, almost, this idea. If you do happen to sin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he's our advocate. He's on our side. And he's mediating. And the, the holiness is uh, applied to us. When we trust in Jesus, then... The righteousness of Christ Jesus applies to us, and we're allowed to be in the presence of God in a miraculous, wonderful way. All right, uh, through this in at the end, why do we end our prayers with, in Jesus' name, amen? It's kind of outside the passage and over, but it's a thinking question, you know. Why do we do that? Well, probably at first, because mom and dad taught us or, or grandpa taught us or somebody or the preacher taught us how to pray but when we get beyond just copycat why because he is the mediator because we don't have to go through a priest or um, go into a tabernacle in between God in us. Yeah. Yes. That's right. And we can count on him to be advocating the Son, to be advocating with the Father. And of course, the Holy Spirit is working in your life too. It's not all working. There's a further reason, but that's definitely what I had in mind. What's a further reason about all this? Well, I don't know if this is the further reason or if it. Um strengthens what Karen said he understands our groanings so even when we can't put into words what we're speaking um he can so I feel like there's an I hate to use the word eloquence but there is an interpretation of what really needs to be done on our behalf okay so that's the role of the Holy Spirit to bring um, that right before uh, but again 
Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they're all working together. They all have different aspects of working together, and they're all united as God at the same time. So, good. Uh, it's interesting to think of the Holy Spirit as this mediator, but that is definitely true. Yes, that is definitely true. That was not what we were studying today, but that is definitely true. And so as mediation, it, it's really good that you brought that out because sometimes we get the idea, oh, well, uh, only the Son is the mediator, but no, the Holy Spirit. Yes. And so I'm thankful you did that. There's another reason. If you ask for something in Jesus' name, he tells you it will be done. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. He gives that great promise. Well, you could be praying to anyone, but when you end it in Jesus' name, that tells you, you know, well, that lets everybody, but that lets Jesus know, I, I'm talking to you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. There's more to it. This is really an expansive type of, of phrase here. We don't often talk about I'm claiming to be his in that statement too. I'm I'm talking to him and I belong to him. Yeah. And yeah. I anticipate being cared for accordingly. Or identifying with him, right? That's kind of the other side of the coin that Rochelle was talking yeah. about. It's really good. I'm glad you brought that out too. And in his name means we're praying or we're asking for things that he approves of it's in his will it we're asking that it be in his will so it's not in god's will to commit adultery so we don't pray lord give me five thousand oh, wives God. like Please. like solomon we can't pray in jesus name in his character and in his will that way because we know it's not and so when we pray this it's kind of really this oh yeah lord i'm asking you to do things that you're going to approve of and i want to place myself where you're going to approve of and name in the bible is also equal to his character so when we ask him we know he has power to do it so he promised he can do it so character and name go together Anything else coming to mind? I think the big one is just really the obvious one, mediator. Yeah, this is how, um, how we show our worship and our trust. We go to Jesus. We go again and again to him because through him, we have access to God the Father. Anything else? Okay, let's have a response of prayer because that's really appropriate to do when we know we can go to God in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, we thank you that you are perfect in every way. We thank you for your holiness, which is beyond really our capacity to understand in every way. You are perfect. You cannot abide sin. Uh, and you always do what is right, and we do not. But we praise you and we thank you, Lord Jesus, for making a way for us to be in your presence, in the presence of God, and brought in again and again so that we don't have to be left out in the cold or just discarded or, or, or crushed even or blasted by your glory or your afterburner kind of thing. You invited us, and you continue to invite us into your presence. And one day, you're coming in full glory, and we will be able to see you face to face because of what you, Lord Jesus, have done for us, applied to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we praise you, and we thank you for interceding on our behalf day after day and giving us grace in so many ways 
your grace overflows to us. Help us to take time to pray and to go to you because of your great invitation to us. Help us to worship. Help us to love you. Help us to trust you. And help us to pray all these things in your will. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay.